Languages are fascinating. I have been studying languages for over two decades. And today we're going to focus on one of my favorite topics, mind you, pronunciation. On this video, we're going to discuss mainly three things. First, we will talk about why you should try to improve your pronunciation in any foreign tongue that you are currently studying. Secondly, we will talk about the techniques you can use in order to identify those very problems you might be experiencing right now as you study the foreign tongue you have chosen. Thirdly, we will talk about specific area accents. So let's get to it. My dearest noble ones, what a pleasure to be here today with you. And yes, you are interested in languages, aren't you? Well, so am I. Well, you see, I think the first question is the most legit of all. I mean, why is it so important to get rid of your own accent, as much as you can, of course, when you speak a foreign language? At the end of the day, you are a foreigner, aren't you? And when you speak a language which is not your own, of course you're going to have an accent. Well, first of all, I think we can all agree that some people have got a thicker accent than others when they speak a, a foreign language. We can all agree with that. But the thing is, I think one of the reasons, this is something I always tell my students, I think one of the reasons why it is important to at least work on your pronunciation, try to improve it, not to get a perfect accent, but to try to um, get as close as possible to the way native speakers actually speak said language, is because we are in a competitive society. But what does that even mean? Say you were to meet two people and you only have a few seconds because you're on a bus and you're about to get off said bus because you're going to Hyde Park, let's say. One person says, I think this book is really good. The other person says, I think this is a good book. Then you get off the bus. Someone approaches you and asks you, you heard those two people speak English, who do you think is better at it? Well, I would say that 99.9% of people will choose the first person because he sounds much better, doesn't he? And yet the question comes, the question is, how do you actually know? I mean, perhaps the latter individual who was the latter candidate who was reading with that thick Italian accent. Um, maybe he had a better understanding of English grammar. I mean, as far as you, as far as we know, he might, might have a perfect understanding of how all hypothetical periods work. He might be really good at conjugating verbs in the passive form. He might know everything there is to know about modal verbs, phrasal verbs, simple past, present perfect simple, present perfect continuous, past perfect. Perhaps he knows everything about English grammar and maybe the first candidate doesn't. Again, maybe the second one is a really good translator. He's excellent at finding the just the right words to express and translate foreign concepts into his own receiving language, meaning his own tongue. But we still chose the first one. Why? Because your pronunciation in a context which is different to an exam, where people can actually see um, your real knowledge is your first business card. Let's put it this way. It is the first thing the people judge. So even if perhaps the first candidate won't pass an English test if he doesn't know how to conjugate verbs properly, and maybe the second one will, the first one is more likely to be chosen as a guide, for example, if someone had to choose just because he sounds better. He just sounds, he sounds more proficient. And what about a job interview? Well, that's exactly the point I'm trying to draw here. A job interview, what, what is a job interview? A job interview, among many other th things, of course, is a, uh, an opportunity for the future employer to choose his employees and sometimes even test their language skills. But how much time do they have? Five minutes, three minutes? Now, in that limited time, pronunciation will play a key role in that person's assessment of your 
language ability. You don't have time to show them how much vocabulary you have learned, maybe a little bit. Pronunciation is a dramatically important factor, not the most important, mind you. You still have to have a basic, solid grammatical foundation and you still need to be rather fluent and you need to have, you know, a lot of other aspects in language learning, like such as the ability to um, understand people speaking, you know, listening abilities, your ability to write perhaps might be important in a job, particularly if you have, you know, customer care and, and such and whatnot. Not. But still, pronunciation is very important for you to be chosen. And it did happen to me quite a lot of time that I was chosen over other people because of the way I was pronouncing. Because please, keep in mind, English is not my first language. Okay, right, this is all impressive. Pronunciation is important, fantastic, but how can you improve it? Well, the first thing you need to do is, of course, identify those areas that, need, that, that you need to work on. But how do you do this? By looking at yourself. You see, every language has got its own system of sounds. And I'm not going to go too technical on this video because I want it to be an easy to access video for beginners who haven't studied uh, deeply concepts such as linguistics and, and, and whatnot. And I will probably make a video which will be much more in depth and, and advanced. But for this video, I'd like to say that when you speak your own language, you've got your own system, your own matrix that many people tend, and sometimes I do it myself, again, I'm not saying that my pronunciation is perfect, but I definitely don't have a thick accent or thick foreign accent when I speak whether uh, other languages such as English, Chinese, Japanese, etc. Um, maybe there is a light accent there, particularly with my intonation, but you do have to consider that I, I don't really have much of an opportunity here in Italy to talk to um, native speakers. Normally, when I go back to England and I stay there for at least a couple of, of weeks, like a fortnight, then my intonation, intonation goes back to normal. At the moment, it's a little weird, I suppose, but still, I don't have a thick accent, I don't think. And most importantly, I can make myself understood. And this is very important. Another one of those things that is important, because sometimes when, you, when your accent, when your foreign accent is too thick, not only you don't sound as proficient as you might well be, but also sometimes it might be difficult to understand you. And this is actually something that many Italians say. They are like, I, I went to England, I went to London, I started talking to the people and they pretended they didn't understand because English people are like that. And no, you didn't pronounce it properly. I mean, let's be honest here, let's be humble. As Italians, sometimes we are a little arrogant, aren't we? Um, let's say things the way they are. Mathematically speaking, what is more likely? That the Brits just want to be assholes, or that you, Italian, and I'm mispronouncing a lot of words in their language. Well, I'm voting for the second one. And that includes me when I first moved to England. I was messing up all the time. And I still mess up sometimes. This is called the, it's the concept of the three-legged dog. Let me explain it very quickly. If take a dog, cut a leg off, mind you, don't actually do it, but I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking, cut a leg off, you can still recognize him to be a dog, right? It's a dog. Now, painting purple, well, it's a three-legged purple dog, but I can still tell it's a dog. Add three different kinds of horns, add three eyes at the back, three tails, a pair of bat wings, make it three times bigger, and add cat claws. What the heck is that now? Can you still recognize it to be a dog? Probably not. So the same thing can be said for a word, you know? You, for example, the word, word. As you can see, when I, now of course there are accents, and I'll get to that in, in a minute, but the way I pronounce it now is word, word. So, what I do, I don't pronounce the R because the specific accent that I have chosen is non-rhotic. Some natives do pronounce it, some natives say word, but I tend to say word. Now, what about the O? It's this sound in the International Phonetic Alphabet and it's the way most native English speakers uh, pronounce it, at least in England. Let's add a Italian R. Word. Word. Now let's change the O into the an Italian O. Word. Word. Now let's change the W into a V sound. Word. 
word. Now let's change the D to a T because some languages do that. Word. Word. Now let's extend a little bit the duration of that vowel. Word. Word. Now let's change the intonation. Let's make it a nice rising pitch. Word. Word. Now let's add an extra vowel at the end of the word, just because some people do. For example, the Japanese tend to add extra vowels at the end, so let's just do it. Vordo. Vordo. Right. I don't think you can understand me now. So there is a line, a thin line, which you cannot pass. And many times, some people pass it without realizing it. Why? Because again, what you do is you take your own matrix of sounds and you impose it into the receiving foreign language. Now, of course, I gave an example with Italian, but the same thing happens when English people, or Americans for that matter, try to speak our language. So let me give you some tips here. Um, let's say a word such as this one here, super famous. Grazie. Buongiorno. All right. So. I have just pronounced them perfectly, because I'm Italian. Now let's pronounce them with an English accent. It becomes grazie, buongiorno. Okay, so what is the difference? And first of all, could you tell the difference? Let's, let's see. I'll, I'll pronounce both ways. First, the proper way, native way. Secondly, the one with the foreign accent. Grazie, 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 grazie. Buongiorno. 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 Tempo. 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 So what's going on here? What's happening is that a lot of speakers, a lot of people who speak English as a first language, again, they are taking their own original sounds and they are encapsulating them within Italian. So many vowels in English, not all vowels, mind you, but many vowels in English are double. For example, spoken. An Italian would say spoken, spoken, rather than spoken, O. Oh. But this double vowel, the, not all O's in English are like this. Of course, you've got vowels like in top, which is O, or vowels like in money, which is A, depending on the area again. But many vowels, particularly the O at the end of words, such as radio, go, no, these have a O sound. This sound is then copy-pasted into Italian, but no O in Italian should be pronounced that way. So, in English, you say no. In Italian, you say no. O. Buon giorno. Not giorno. Giorno. Also, in Italian, we roll the R. So you should try to do that too. Well, what if you can't? Well, don't worry, don't. I mean, you will have a slight accent, but it's better to have a slight accent than to have a thick accent, to at least get rid of all the other things. Grazie. E. Not a. Like, actually, many dictionaries tell you to pronounce. Like, it's, it's funny. These dictionaries, the Italian dictionaries for English-speaking people that use English phonetics, but it doesn't work because it tells you to say grazie. There is no a. It's e. Grazie. E. That's the sound. So always don't, don't ignore those dictionaries, hear the natives and copy them, mimic. Lovely jubbly, I'm really enjoying this. This is jolly good, but I can't do it. I mean, how, how do you do it? I, mean, I try, but I don't, don't even hear perhaps these differences sometimes. Well, of course it takes time and I always tell my students, make the habit of listening to the language that you are studying. So watch films and watch TV series in that language or try to find videos on YouTube on people, of people speaking that language daily. Daily, this is key. Don't just do it once a week or once a month. And you watch a film for three hours in English or in French or in Italian or in Japanese and expect your ears to get used to it. It doesn't work like that. You got to do it. You got to make it into a habit. It's the only way you can communicate with your brain and actually tell yourself that you need that to gain that skill. Otherwise, why wasting energy coming from sugar, coming from carbohydrates, coming from food? that you have gained 
for a skill that you don't use if you just do it once a week. Well, never mind. That's not how br the brain works. The only way to send a powerful message to your brain in which you tell it, listen, mate, if you do call your brain mate, well, I do sometimes. Listen, mate, I need to get this skill done. So just pack it in and get to work. The only way you want you can do this is daily practice. It doesn't have to be like three hours a day. Of course, the longer the better. This is why when you actually move to another country, it's good because you are surrounded by that language all the time. But if you don't have that chance now, because either, uh, you either don't have the money, don't have the financial possibility, you're still living with your parents, you just can't do it, you've got kids, you've got a job, whatever the reason, you have to simulate. Simulating means that you need to surround yourself with that language as much as you can. You don't have a lot of time? Yes, you do. Because when you come back from work, before going to bed, just 15 minutes, watch a film, no subtitles, mind you, if you really want to, you know, increase your ability to hear a language. Doesn't matter if you don't understand. I mean, if I go to the gym and I pick up a, a, a you know, a dumbbell, I mean, I'm not expecting to, to, get, to get a huge bicep just after a couple of weeks. It takes time and it takes endurance. You, you got to persevere until the end. In other words, give it time. Give it three months. If you are persistent, I promise you, you will see success, no matter who you are, what your age is. Of course, the, the younger, the easier, but whatever age you are, if you are persistent, your brain will perform accordingly, bringing results, applicable, real results. Wonderful talk. What if I don't have 15 minutes at the end of the day? I mean, I am so busy that I gotta take care of my kids, I gotta take my kids to school, gotta talk to my wife. If I start watching a film, instead of taking care of my wife and talking to her, she's gonna freaking murder me. What am I gonna do? What am I supposed to do? Well, piece of cake. Have you got commuting time to your workplace? Perfect opportunity for some listening. You are, you are in your car, instead of listening to Elton John or whatever you're listening to, the Beatles, just Oasis perhaps, just put a CD or just download something and, and put it there where you hear people speaking that language. And again, you don't have to do it for an hour. Well, if you do, it will be good, but you can do just half an hour, 20 minutes. If it's daily, it will bring results. It's much better to listen to that language for 20 minutes every day than it is to actually, you know, listen for four hours on a Monday and just don't do it for 10 days, that doesn't work. It's not how we are built. It's not like how the synapses in our brain work. You don't have a car, no problem. MP4 player, your phone, whatever. Download it, you're waiting at the bus stop. It's a perfect opportunity to study the language. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't put in the effort, you're not gonna see the results. And again, in a competitive society, you cannot aim for second place. You gotta aim for number one. This, you need to be fluent if you want to work with those languages. If you're just studying it for your own enjoyment, still, I think it would be much better to be able to actually see results and be able to speak to those foreigners rather than just being so afraid, being like, oh yeah, maybe I need a little bit more time and then 10 years pass and you still haven't get it done. Now is the time, daily, 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 daily. I don't get that, shh. Okay, so, um, daily practice, got that one down, what am I supposed to do now? Identify what the typical problems are. Um, so, it really depends on what, it, what your first language is and what the uh, foreign language you're going to learn um, is. For example, if I, let's say I'm Italian, okay, I'm Italian, I want to learn Spanish. What are the differences between Italian and Spanish? Not much as far as the R is concerned. Vowels are rather similar. Intonation is different, so I do need to do some listening. And most importantly, in Spanish, uh, or in some variant of Spanish, um, they pronounce the uh, C and the Z as a Th. So, gracias, conversación, cabeza. We don't have that sound in Italian, so th is going to be a problem. And notice it, how many Italians and French, and perhaps Portuguese as well, have this problem when they speak English. They just can't get the th pronounced properly. When they say think, they say think. When they say bath, they say but. When they say mother, they say mother. When they say bra, I think you get the point. That's because they don't have that sound, so you've got to focus on those sounds that you don't 
have that don't come naturally for you. Secondly, um, for example, a Greek might not have that problem because they do have both the the sound, like in Dori, and the th sound, like in Athena. Now, the French have a tendency of putting any stress to in the very end, uh, final syllable of most of their words. So, what they do is that they tend to, to do that also when they speak a foreign language. So, for example, uh, I remember I had a friend from France and we were in England and we were visiting a friend of ours uh, whose name was Veronica. Now, when he talked to her, he would say Veronica, Veronica, rather than Veronica. So, that's one thing you do need to work on and for example many Italians do mispronounce the word uh, management they say management and they mispronounce the word develop which becomes develop so stress is also another important factor and that's the same for foreigners who speak Italian because for example we say periodo we don't say periodo that was just one example of course so pronunciation of vowels consonants sometimes are problematic and uh, the intonation and last but not least, the stress, which I myself sometimes mess up. Yes, but not too much, I hope. Like I did say consonant in one of the videos I made, but now I know it's consonant. Uh, thank to you, actually. So, cheers. Thank you. Grazie. Okay, so now you are getting better, you're getting closer to... You sound closer to the way a native sounds. Um, what accent should you choose? I mean, there are so many ways to speak a foreign language. Uh, for example, even English, you've got American English, which in itself has got a lot of different variants, okay? Because a person from New York, like with a real New York accent, and a person from Texas, a person from Utah, a person from California, they all have different accents. And then, you know, you've got, you, of course, you've got general American, you know, with people in, in TV normally use, but still, there are many different accents. Um, England, my goodness, never mind. I mean, Mancunian accent, Scouse accent, Cockney, um, posh English accent, you've got the Brumies, you've got the Geordies. I mean, England is like very similar to Italy. You just turn around the corner and people have got a different accent, particularly in London, mind you. Gosh, my goodness, my, how many accents that city has, which makes sense considering the population. And of course, all languages are like that. We don't always realize that. We sometimes assume that that's something that only happens in our own language. Well, when we think of a foreign language, well, they all have their own. And no, all languages are like that. I mean, they're not all the same. Of course, for example, in America, I think you do need to travel longer distances before actually identifying an, a severe difference in the way they pronounce things. But that's because America is huge, huge. There is a lot of space. And there are also many other reasons. Like like in Italy, you've got so many different dominations, so many different influences of other languages and cultures that it's quite obvious that, again, seriously, in Italy, I go to the bakery and the guy in the bakery has got a different accent than the guy in the other bakery. It's just, been, okay, never mind, I'm just exaggerating a little bit. But yes, little towns, um, even 50 miles drive, you will find already a difference in pronunciation, which will be common to all the people living in that area. But still, very big differences will be regional differences and main cities. For example, a Florence accent, a Rome accent, a Venezia, a Venetian accent, a Sicilian accent, or Palermo accent perhaps, and a Naples accent, they are so different and distinct that if you want to hear them, uh, I've got a, a video about it, I'll leave a link in the description below. There are subtitles. Go on, just click it. Oh, for goodness gracious, just one click. I'm not asking for that much. Gosh, this video's getting long. I mean, you do ramble a lot when, when you talk about... Uh, am I talking to myself? Try to choose one accent and focus on that one. You don't have to get it perfect, but at least I would rather not mix. For example, if I start speaking, you know, mixing American words and British words and some words I pronounce like an American and I start saying, hello, my darling, can I get some water? Uh, it's 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 weird, you know, it sounds like I, I don't really, it's, it sounds like a mess to be honest. So I would rather say, choose one set of vocabulary, choose what, make sure you can understand all of them because otherwise you won't be able to work with it. So as far as listening is concerned, listen to as many different accents as you can, but try to choose one and focus on mimicking that specific accent. I would normally um, suggest you to choose these standard version of that language uh, but you know it really depends on a lot of different factors I don't have time to talk about it now so choose the one you like and try to imitate it to the best of your abilities 
For example, to give you just a couple of examples, if I hear someone um, saying things like, and if you're interested in learning how to pick or to get a specific Italian accent, I might make a video on that, like how to get a Rome accent, how to get a Florence accent, how to sound like someone from Venice, how to sound like someone from Palermo, from Naples, Sardinia perhaps, I mean, you name it, Milano, you know, that's a big one as well. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, I might actually do a series out of this, but anyways, I think this is about it for today's video. I hope I've given you enough um, tips to improve your pronunciation. Uh, also, make sure to always ask natives to correct your pronunciation, because sometimes some people, they don't correct you because they're like, well, I can sort of understand what he's saying, and maybe they don't want to offend you, but make sure that when you've got friends who speak the language that you, you know, and tell them that it's okay, you know, that for them to correct you because actually it's a good way to uh, to learn this is something i did when i was in england i always asked my friends correct my pronunciation if i say something wrong like if i say when i said like at first i used to say asked and they told me it's more like it's more like asked with a kt sound and i never made that mistake since so i'm grateful for that so you do need to be humble don't get mad don't get angry when people correct you if it's a constructive uh, critique and if they start making fun of you well always remember most of those people who make fun of you when you s speak uh, their language they only know one language so at the end of the day you know one and a half well they are the stupid ones then all right i hope that you enjoyed this linguistic video tomorrow we've got a really good video about the foundation of rome we're going to talk about iron age bronze age prehistorical times and the actual site where the Caput Mundi was founded. So look forward to that. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I will be seeing you tomorrow for my next daily upload. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. Arrivederci. Pizza. No?